Now we can the name and our smart Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to this uh, first official workshop of this arm. We are uh, already working um, quite some months. This is the first time that we have an external public uh, joining us. Um, my name is Greta Nikas. I was asked to be your facilitator and moderator. I'm not a specialist in antibiotics, but I'm uh, the communication manager and colleague of uh, the coordinating team, Erwin and uh, Lien, uh, uh, Frederick Lien. Um, um, maybe I should um, tell you that half of the public joining this uh, meeting, this workshop, is not here as they are following on the webinar. So that is why uh, there are some cameras active. And that is also why um, I will ask you um, not to whisper too much in between you uh, because everything goes through to the webinar persons and uh, we want them to have very clear um, voice uh, of the persons who speak. As you know, this arm is um, believing very strongly in interaction and the strength of interaction, and so also this workshop uh, ought to be uh, interactive. That is what we are going to try to do uh, during the discussion with the panel. I give the floor now to um, our president and colleague, uh, um, Erwin Wouters. He is senior researcher of the Flanders Research Institute for Agriculture, Food and Fisheries in Flanders, as I said. Please uh, give us uh, the introduction, Erwin. Uh, thank you, Grit, and uh, welcome to uh, all of you. Thanks for being here. Also, yes. Uh, Welcome uh, here and thanks for coming. Also welcome for the people who are sitting in their homes or offices and following the live stream. Uh, as a member of the coordinating team Ilvo, I have the honor of giving you a short introduction and then let the harder work be done by uh, other project partners um, and, and by you uh, at the end of, the, of our day today uh, in the panel discussion. Um, these are a very short introduction. This is not. Technical difficulty number one. <laughs> yeah, okay. So this is more or less our tagline. Uh, during our first meeting, we actually discussed quite a long bit about what would be our tagline, what is this arm actually about. And it's, uh, we aim to reduce antibiotic resistance by cutting the need for antibiotics in livestock farming, by focusing on disease prevention and targeted use of antibiotics. That's our tagline, I said we aim so the main, the end goal, and which is why we receive money, public money from the European Commission to do this project, is of course to reduce the threat for antibiotic resistance in livestock farming. Uh, when I say we, I mean this group of, uh, it's the logos, it's uh, this group of partners from uh, different countries all over Europe. I'm not going to read them out loud, so you can find more information about each partner and also contact details on our website. And um, all partners also have people represented uh, in the room somewhere. Uh, they are distributed all around Europe. Um, they, we have quite a lot of partners who are from here, from Belgium. Um, but of course, partners like Copa Cojeca, our host of the day, and, and international uh, dairy farming, they of course cover a much larger area than just uh, Belgium. Uh, but we are um, we have partners from uh, many different countries, uh, and we also uh, study many different production systems and second sectors. This arm is a Horizon 2020, uh, so it's a European project, and it's in the thematic network type of project. 
Thematic networks, in the words of the European Commission, is about compiling knowledge that is ready for practice, but not yet enough in practice. It's about collecting scientific knowledge, but also knowledge that's maybe not really published in reports or papers, but that exists already in practice on the field, so-called best practices, uh, to collect them and to further disseminate them, spread them uh, throughout the target at end users of this knowledge who can benefit uh, from it and, and through which they can improve uh, livestock production systems. Uh, it's also about translating the knowledge, not just making it available, because often it is already available, but it's not available in the right form. It's not, uh, it's not adapted to different contexts or different production systems. So it's also about translating knowledge that is there into easily understandable material videos. Uh, you'll see already some of them today. Uh, leaflets, guidelines, really recommendations that are not targeted towards other scientists, but towards people who have to use them or can use them and can do something with it. Um, in the, most of my uh, introduction, I'm going to present you the, the ideas and assumptions, although they're more than assumptions, but what is behind? What are the foundations of our project? What is guiding what we do and how we do it? Uh, there are six such ideas. Uh, all of them are based in science, uh, veterinary sciences, but also social sciences. And we combine these uh, insights into our approach and into the way we work. Uh, because that's what a thematic network is about. It's using what we already know or think we know and making it uh, more readily available. First one is that, that there is a strong link between the level of antibiotic use and resistance. The European Commission, they want more prudent use, which is one that causes less antibiotic resistance. And we know from evidence that there is a strong link between the level of usage and resistance, so that it will be quite often about reducing the usage, especially reducing the average use in a sector and the total use in a sector. The level of usage is often also more habits than really something based on clear deliberation, based on health status, health risk. So we know we will also have to work on motivations, knowledge, behavior uh, of the people involved in antibiotic use. And we also know that production, welfare, health of the animals can be maintained with much less antibiotics than that are often used. Uh, we know this from evidence, uh, they are not always necessary to maintain production, health and welfare. The second is, uh, it's a sort of tagline from the European Commission, it's as little as possible, as much as necessary, and that's also what we use. We, our, our main, our final goal is not zero use. It's a use that causes much less antibiotics, that is exactly how much it's supposed to be, as little as possible, as much as necessary. So we do try, or we want to try to reduce actual use to actually uh, what is as much as uh, necessary and as little as possible. That's uh, step one in the upper figure, but we also try to reduce what is necessary. Uh, it's in our tagline, we try to reduce the needs for antibiotics. So uh, we do both. We try to reduce actual use to what is actually necessary, but we also try to even further reduce what is still necessary. And it will be very far specific. The bottom figure is not based on actual data. It's a stylized figure that very well represents what we often see in a sector, especially there in sectors where they have already managed to reduce the average use quite a bit. Average use, average reported use often does not exist. It is a result of a group of very low users and a group of very high users. Our recommendations, the knowledge we make readily available for these farms will, will be different. In the first group, it's probably on trying to maintain the reduction they already achieved and maybe further reduce the need for antibiotics. While in the group on the right-hand side, it's maybe still about reducing the actual use to just what is necessary in those forms. It's about level of usage, but we also don't forget quality of usage. It's also not just about the quantity, but about uh, what type of antibiotics, when they use them, and, and, and how much they use them, and how long. EFSA, European Food Safety Authority, talks about replace, uh, reduce, replace, rethink. So that's also what we try to do. We try to reduce whenever possible, but not just reduce everywhere without some alternatives, without some measures to replace antibiotics. Examples are mentioned here, but also without rethinking 
protection systems in terms of biosecurity, in terms of husbandry practice, or even in terms of production systems as a whole to further reduce the need for antibiotics. So it's not just reducing as such. We will aim for disseminating solutions to reduce the need for antibiotics and reduce antibiotic resistance, but also we will disseminate methods to achieve that the best solution, exactly because these methods will be farm specific, context specific, they might evolve, uh, they might be production system specific, species specific, lots of specificity, which requires also attention for disseminating not just a solution that's supposed to work everywhere, but to disseminate methods to come with the best solution for a specific case. We also try to uh, achieve external motivation that is evolving into internal motivation to really reduce or improve the way antibiotics are used. Thematic network, it is a learning network. It's not about us sitting in our offices producing knowledge. It's about learning and interacting with people and making them learn and improve. And science has said that people learn when it's fun to learn, when it's not just in a controlling, uh, prescribing environment, but when it's fun and then people become internally motivated. So that's also what we try to achieve in our learning network, in our approaches uh, to make it fun to learn uh, and not uh, acting or blaming farmers that, that they are bad users or high users uh, without, of course, necessarily giving up external motivators. External motivators you could think in terms of the carrot or the stick uh, or rewards or penalties. Sometimes that might still be necessary to maintain. And we focus not only on farmers but on the whole complex of stakeholders that might affect uh, disease prevention, that might affect health on farms and thus might affect the need for antibiotics. But these are six ideas, six assumptions that uh, underlie our work and what we do. And this is just one figure uh, explaining what we do, and some colleagues will uh, explain some parts of this further. Uh, I said we, uh, we are a number of partners, but it's not just us. We have established a community of practice, which is us, but then uh, a large number of farmers, veterinarians, industry people, government people, all kinds of people who might have good ideas uh, or who might have a role in further dissemination of our results. That community of practice is helping us to disseminate what we think we know. It's also helping us to collect information from the field. And that feeds on the one hand the state of the arts where we really make a database of what we know and what is available and what works in which situation to reduce antibiotic resistance. And at the same time, we demonstrate what we know works, an approach to really get knowledge to the farmers. And it's uh, the multi-actor farm health plans. It's a coaching approach where farmers, their advisors, their veterinarians, facilitate by a coach sit together, design a plan, and follow up the plan. Uh, and a plan basically to reduce the need for antibiotics. And based on all that, we will uh, exploit a whole range of communication activities, uh, going from practice guides, practice abstracts, we will produce videos, um, webinars like this one. Uh, there will be national and international exchange activities, farmers visiting each other to learn um, events and workshops, different kinds of material, different kinds of messages, and also different formats to bring the message to the people that should receive it and can hopefully use it. This is where you can find us online on our website and on our uh, Twitter handle. Uh, and there is also a Facebook group, which is the vehicle through which we organize formally the online community of practice. But that will be explained um, later today. So with this uh, very short introduction, but I hope you have a taste of what this arm is about, what the ideas are that underlie our work. And with this, I give the word back to our moderator. Thank you. Well, Erwin gives a good example by switching off his microphone. I just need to explain to you that uh, when we go in a dialogue that uh, uh, we have only one microphone at a time, so uh, you switch it on, and then when you finish, you switch it off, and then the next one can speak. Um, 
Thank you very much. Um, uh, what I understand, Erwin, is that reducing the need of use of antibiotics is really a big challenge, life-saving challenge, maybe. Um, that is why I invite uh, our colleague uh, Friedrich Lehn to come forward to explain how far have we come until now, how are the um, uh, farm teams doing, how exactly do you harvest the do's and don'ts that need to be uh, uh, in the final uh, practice guidelines. Uh, Friedrich Lehn is a colleague of ILFO, the uh, Flanders Institute for uh, Research on Agriculture, Food and Fisheries in France. Please take it forward. Uh, thank you very much, Kate, for the introduction. Uh, once more, from my side, thanks a lot for the, the generous uh, show up today. Um, thanks for being here. I'm privileged and delighted to present this work package for on behalf of this uh, group of people that we have the privilege to work with uh, on this very important topic. Um, so I will discuss with you the farm animal health teams uh, for health and livestock protection and prudent use of antibiotics and it's like sounds really abstract i can imagine so i guess i can better start by making it very tangible and practical to do so here you see what we envisage uh, and i'm happy to, to to use an example of, uh, of our colleagues at Alteo, who are already practicing uh, this approach um, you see a farmer you see his veterinarian you see um, a feed advisor all together with a coach around the table working on a farm specific action plan and the action plan means that they're working in a team way to come up with strategies concrete action plans action plans for the farmer to implement and to improve his farm to improve the health status his disease prevention his biosecurity all of those things not just to improve the farm but also to reduce the needs for uh, yeah, applying antibiotic treatments to his animals. So that's a very uh, concrete um, example of what we envisage. And so there are three key ingredients to this approach. You see the team, the three persons of different uh, expertise to... Uh, to short? Yeah. Okay. Thanks for the advice. Um, so the three, key, three uh, ingredients are the people working together from different backgrounds, the coach who is there to guide these people in a successful way of collaborating, and the farm-specific actions. And I would like to touch upon these things uh, with you in, the, in this session. And so I want to share with you why we believe promoting this approach is valuable, what is the added value, um, how we want to do it, and then also stress the importance of the coaching part in this, in this, uh, in this area. And then also, uh, not ex cathedra, but also show promising results from science and from practice to you today of that the approach can work. So um, we believe that sustainable uh, livestock farming isn't equal to using antibiotic treatments in a uh, yeah in a, in a way to, to do to, to, as a cover up for suboptimal management, suboptimal farm organization, or suboptimal practices. So we need to change this. And reducing the need for antibiotics is more, there's more to it than just stop using it. It's really, we, we, we know that it's not that easy. We know that it requires a null of intention process because you have to rethink the, the very farm practices from the beginning onwards, maybe uh, to go into the fundamentals and improve the fundamentals to improve the farm before it can do without uh, the, the, the preventive antibiotic treatments or to, to, yeah, to improve the farm in that way. But it will also mean that certain routines and behaviors will need to change on the farm. And that can be the hardest part maybe as well. And also change perceptions and presumptions by the people in practice that they can do without, that they can reduce the use without hampering their economic performance, their technical performance, and that they have the confidence in themselves that they can pull it off that they can improve their farm to that extent that they can do without or with very much lower antibiotics. And we believe that promoting this uh, approach of, of teams and, and, and coaching these teams can benefit the farm improvement 
or for different reasons. Because you gather different backgrounds, different sources of knowledge at the table, and you can benefit from the synergy in the discussions between all those people at that time. It has added value over individual consultations of a farmer who first consults his veterinarian, gets advice, then goes to his field advisor, gets advice. The advice might not be coherent, might be the, the farmer might get lost, and, and so this, this working in team can be beneficial to streamline this, to get coherent advice, all in the same direction, everybody is aware of what is needed and the, and the common goal is there, so everybody can contribute from his power and his, his strength to this, to this common goal. Um, moreover, you have shared ownership and motivation by working in team, you can make people accountable for doing their contribution to, to, to the team achievement. And, and lastly, also, there is just the human factor that the people in the team can support the farmer in reinforcing him, doing the good stuff, and keep doing the good stuff. So those are all reasons we think why this approach is valuable. And so this slide is familiar already for you. You see how this uh, work package takes a quite big role in our, pro, uh, in our project and how we want to collect success stories from our case studies to promote in, uh, in a wider sense in Europe, in the livestock industry, through various uh, dissemination routes by practice abstracts, practice guides, videos, workshops, events, to promote uh, this, this, uh, this way of working by showing successful case studies from practice that are tangible for the people out there in practice. And so, um, as you saw from the from the previous slide, we want to channel also the knowledge we get from other activities in the project, the database which we're making, the discussions on the platform which will be um, uh, discussed further uh, this day, the, that, that there is knowledge uh, circulating and that we can challenge this knowledge into the team work if the people want to. For example, if they run into a problem, we can offer them to ask the question online to the virtual European livestock community. Somebody out there might have a good idea on how to solve a problem as well. Um, so that's what we're aiming for. And then as an output, like I already said, we want to produce successful case stories to show the value of the approach. Uh, we want to do video testimonies with the farmers, the vets, and the team members to yeah, have tangible testimonies for, for others to get inspired. And we won't also want to make an online farm health team toolbox. A toolbox so that the people who want to do the approach as well can find guidelines on how to do it on their own. Because yeah, we cannot coach everybody in Europe, unfortunately. Um, so we will try to make a good toolbox that people can know what to do, how to do it, and, and be successful in their own uh, situation or context. And then also we'll focus on doing workshops in the different countries to explain this toolbox and use also the success stories there to make it tangible and promote the approach. And as you see, um, how we, we focus on different species in, in, in Europe, so the Netherlands and Spain will focus on pigs, which is quite logical, of course. And um, we in Flanders and in uh, Latvia will focus on broiler protection. Romania and the UK will focus on dairy. And France and Greece will do uh, dairy sheep in their countries. And so in total, we aim for 40 uh, farms. And we're also negotiating, I would say, with Denmark to include also some case studies in the dairy sector. So the practical core of action of such a uh, such a team will be the following. We start with recruiting the farms who are willing to take on the approach. Um, we will do an, uh, a farm intake, basically looking what their current status on biosecurity, on animal health, what are their, what is their performance, what is their use in antibiotics, which antibiotics are they using, which level, um, to really get like an initial assessment of where do we start from. Then we ask, the people on the team, the farmer, the vet, the, uh, the, the other team members, the field advisors, to do a self-assessment of the farm, a questionnaire to get their perspective on the farm, what are they doing good, what can be points of improvement already. So we as coaches can see whether they're on the same page 
or whether we have to work to work on a common agreement on the problem and on what we tackle. So then, in the first meeting with the team, we will do a common diagnosis of the farm, so to say, to see this is the problem, this has to be solved to make good steps forward, and then go from that diagnosis into concrete, smart actions that can be uh, designated to people and can be executed and monitored efficiently. And so then the farmer can start implementing the plan. We will get in touch on a monthly basis uh, to see how they're doing, where we can coach him to, to, to really pull it off. And also we encourage the other team members and the farmer to join on a regular basis to also have this evaluation of how the implementation is going. Then halfway around, we will do a midterm evaluation to see already if we can mm, see some progress on, on level and how they're sustaining the changes we propose. And maybe also add new things or delete things that, that were just infeasible. Um, and, and around the same time, so like in, in six to eight months, we will also initiate the knowledge exchange between those pilot teams on the national and international level. And I come back to that in the next slide. So afterwards, we just continue in the same way um, to finalize the process, uh, the case studies, uh, like uh, one and a half year later, to do a final evaluation, to do a final photograph, actually again, assess the state of the farm at that time, to see how they're doing and what the progress was to make our uh, our successful case study report. So I thought about that we will also initiate knowledge exchange in different levels. So this is what we envisage. Um, on the national level, we would like, or we will, organize farm visits to every pilot farm. And then in each turn, the pilot farm is in the center of attention and we set the agenda together with the farmer. I want to discuss these successes and these challenges with those other teams and to get their practical advice on how to go about these challenges, what I can do from their point of view. So this, this works, this has been practiced in Denmark, it's useful because, yeah, Every farmer knows he will be in the center of attention at, at his turn, so they take it serious and they put effort in doing, advising the, the other farmers. Moreover, there's mutual levels of learning there because you can learn as a farmer from being in the center of attention. You can learn as a farmer of giving advice to the other farmer, and you can learn as a farmer observing the farm and observing the advice given from one farmer to another, so there are multiple layers to get uh, Get out with them. And then on the international level, we do uh, we will do uh, three day cross visits to um, have experience uh, exchange between the, the 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 countries focusing on the same species but in different conditions, but with the same challenge in mind to uh, to see what their experience are also with with the teams and uh, to exchange yeah knowledge and experience. And then also, like we said, we will do practical workshops and events nationally to promote with the farmers um, to the, the sectors at the national level, novice vets and novice farmers, this approach. So I promised that I would talk about the key ingredients, and now I want to um, go a bit more in depth on the coaching part and why it's important. So if you look at a bit what coaching does or the definition, it means that you can help a person make change in the desired direction in a desirable manner. And so it brings out the potential to uh, improve performance, to build awareness, motivate people to make a change, and lead to change and motivate choices in, in this process. Um, and if we project that on, uh, on the antibiotics reduction in the life industry, we can say that it's quite demanding on a farm because it requires uh, management changes, which also can be behavioral changes and attitude changes towards the state. So um, it can be demanding and coaching can play a role there to, to make this change happen. Moreover, as it's already said by Erwin, we believe in a very farm specific approach because every context is different and like every coaching trajectory is different. So it needs to be tailor-made to the farmer and the farm, his resources and his capabilities to make the changes they, they're, they're possible. And so coaching can help to do um, 
to work on several steps in making a change process. It has no use to, yeah, to provide books, websites, tools to a farmer to make a change if he's not aware of why he should change. He must be aware of why he should work on reducing antibiotics, not just from the, the risk of, of, of uh, transmitting resistance to the human uh, medicine, but it's very uh, good reason to do it, but also just for his own um, yeah, uh, possibility to, to, to be able to use antibiotics in the future to maintain his product production, his productivity, and his welfare of his animals. So um, I think these are good reasons to, to work on and to convince the people why the change is necessary. Um, but certainly also the risk, the potential risk of, of the, the resistance problem for the global community. So once you have awareness, you can work on desire of those people to really make them willing to make a change, get them convinced and committed to the change process. And from that moment onwards, you can start the traditional way of providing knowledge and uh, guidance in making a change happen. And um, afterwards, when the when this change has been successful, you can start reinforcing the people to sustain the changes they've made. So yesterday, we had a training session on how to follow these different coaching steps, and we hope that it will help us make the case study successful. And so you might think, well, you're, you're, it's nice to say all those things, which haven't done it yet so far. So I'm very privileged and happy that I can invite a, an expert to the floor. We have today with us Jana van der Berg, who is a former coach from ZLTO, who practices this on a, on a daily basis. And she will also share her experiences with us uh, and, and talk about the added value of coaching in, in the last year. So Gemma, we wait for, uh, well, take your time. Don't hurt yourself in the process. And uh, we look forward to your talk. It's working? Yes, okay. Um, as a coach, you have to stress yourself, they say. Yeah? You have to step out of your comfort zone. No, this is out of my comfort zone for sitting for you for you <laughs> and talking in English. So I try my best, but sometimes I need some help, perhaps. <laughs> but who I? I am uh, Kemmer van der Berg, and I'm a farmers coach at ZLTO. So my, my daily job is uh, speaking a lot of with, um, for the farmers and try to get them to a higher level with the performance of their company. That's what my job is. <clears throat> so um, the starting point of the process is to reflect on the behavior and the beliefs with all those who are involved in farm. Uh, so in addition to the farm, we also reflect the behavior of the feed advisor and the veterinarian. Uh, in the primary research, we also had by uh, Helen Prinsen uh, from ZLGO, uh, has shown that pig farmers, in this uh, specific, specific case, who are currently uh, already carrying this out, are often stuck between the feed advisor and the veterinarian. So we don't know which way he has to choose. Um, in a technical solution with the feed advisor and veterinary is not a standard procedure for farms. I first thought when I visited the farms that it was normally that they every month come together and talk with each other what's going wrong, what's going good, how can we, what for kind of things we can change so get it to a high level. But in practical, it's not you, not working. So one, two times a year they're sitting together if you are lucky. So there must be something done by the communication. And because the communication now is not clear, um, uh, the solution are not clear and assumptions arise as a result of distrust, distrust towards giving advice at the farm management, but makes it easier to, to use antibiotics instead of uh, looking to the animal behavior and the health of the animals. So how do we approach it? Uh, we choose um, we go in, uh, we, we ask the farmer who is involved at his farm. So we get a list of people who are involved at the farm. And that's most of the time feed advisor, sometimes too, and veterinary, but also can be something by, um, on the genetics, 
or someone uh, who is the business uh, manager uh, who's on the company or even the partner of the farmer. So we're sitting with a whole round the table uh, who is involved at the farm. Um, and then we're going to challenge them how they, what are their dreams, how they plan things and how they do things. And uh, there they get from us a questionnaire. They have to fill in in the first, uh, yeah, by, by the computer, they have to fill in the questionnaire. Um, and then we can reflect them by their personality. So on the left side, you see, we call that an Enneagram, that's what we from all the people made. And then you see um, uh, a circle with some arrows in it. And so if you, sometimes you see that people are a helper or a peacemaker, sometimes they are an achiever. And nothing is good and nothing is bad, but some behaviors are quite, every, every personality has its own qualities, but also its own pitfalls. And what you see if, if you are, we speak uh, open with everybody, because we have very like four or five uh, yeah, questionnaires of uh, reports to each other. And then you see the very diversity of the people on the table. And that makes it easier to communicate because sometimes you don't know why this, if he says something is going to my elect in my allergy, why do I get the redneck if he's talking to me? <laughs> and that's because he said sometimes he's so um um the talker was a talker achieved. Involved. Involved, so involved, uh, that he's so stuck in his mindset that he doesn't get the other part, the other person who's in the table. Get through it. It goes, no, they don't see each other anymore. So they don't listen to each other anymore. Um, if you see this on the right one, these people, the, from this poor person who we fill it in, that's an, um, a really achiever. So he wants to be successful. He wants to be in the front. He is very um, confident about himself. Um, but he's, he has less with, um, with, with people who are helping him. So he's no, he has nothing with help, mm -hmm. not a part of him. And if uh, you also see on the light, left side, you see uh, arrows in this circle. And if uh, an achiever has a very good day and he has good energy, then he swims like a salmon upstream. So he goes to the wrong direction and then he gets the good part of the loyalist. So he is very honorable to everybody and he's very um, polite. If there is stress and he has lots of pressure on his shoulders, then he goes to the pitfalls of the peacemaker. So he cannot do decide anything. He's going to uh, say yes but does no um, and try to keep it quiet and no make no make uh, arguments with anyone but uh, that's uh, if he is if he falls in his pitfall this we try to get the people um in their strength that's where i strongly believe so i give you an example that everybody knows you are many of you have possible children and the children is part, and he comes at home with a report of school, and he has a five for language and an eight for mathematics. Many parents still say, will say to the children, you should do a better job to get that five to make six. Um, so well, uh, at the time, it's very difficult for the child to make it five, six, because it's not his quality. His quality is mathematics. So if we let them grow in the, in the qualities, it's much easier to make from that 8 or 9 or 10 because it's fun and it's giving energy. If we give them in a positive way, we want to give, let it grow. Am I clear? Yes. Yeah. yeah? Okay. Next one. This also works the same from the farmer's perspective. Um, if you watch to the striding, you see three colors. The green one is for the dreaming, the blue one is for the thinking, and the red one is for the doing. Um, those nine steps um, has to. <coughs> do you have to, as every farmer, every entrepreneur has to do these nine steps every time again, and it can be within like small things or a big thing. So if it's a small thing like um, change for another 
onderhoudendelen, um, let me see. Yeah, the large points like, like building a new barn, that's a, a long process. But also a, a small one like um, weaning the piglets on another day, because it's easier with uh, working people. So we we'll take it, I take you to the process to make it clear. And let's say we take the investing in a new stable. Let's start by one. The, the farmer has an idea. He wants that new farm. That's the idea. And then there's step two. He has to investigate what kind of stable do I want? Um, and when should it be ready? That's my goal. And at three, and what are the options? And he has to make a swap analyze. And, that, uh, and then he would go by four, and by four he has to, ch he has to, we, he has to get game support. Will the, will or maybe yeah, there's a bank uh, who needs to finance the new stable. And the bank will ask him questions. Is this really what you want? And what are the risks? And what are the opportunities? So they start checking if he did the stock one till three, right. If he can't give the answer to the bank, the bank will say, give you no money. So you can start again with one. And if you have a good uh, step one, two, three, uh, did well, then the bank says, here you have the money, you can go. But at the end, at step five, the farmer only can decide, am I going to build or not? And if he has uh, decided to go, then he can uh, start the construction. But however, he started construction, he has to always come, uh, com um, complain, what's the um, Confrontation. Yeah, to face the confrontation. So he has to fight to make the job done. <laughs> and then he goes by step eight. He has to stuck in the problem and he completes the process. And at nine, he's going to reflect on his process. What did I do? Did I do good? What would I do other way? Am I happy with it? Am I enjoying it? So, but also in this one, in this nine steps, not every person is the same in all those nine steps. So it's, it's much um, better as, as a team and every person has his own qualities. And, you, and we see at the table that if there are four or five people, the circle gets round. So um, no, the, the veterinarians are often good um, observ observators. And uh, the farmer himself is uh, he wants to realize that was his strong head. And um, so if everyone has his own qualities, and then we get the shape around, and then if you talk to each other, they say, "Ha, ah, you're good at that. So I got the idea, so you can work it out." And that makes the group and the, the feeling good. So they said they put a step forward. And if we have uh, done that, then we go making a brain, brain map. So in the process of uh, reducing the antibiotics, we put that in the middle. That's the yellow spots. And then everyone on the table can call something they think about if they want to reduce the antibiotics. So it's coming, <coughs> let's say, climate, uh, the colostrum, uh, the, uh, the guilds, um, anything they can call, management, everything they call. And, and then they stop. Okay, at one point they don't have any birds more. And then I ask the question: Is this the only? Is this the way you want to work? Is this the point? What's in the middle? That's the most important for now to change. And sometimes they choose one of the others. And then we put that in the middle and we start again. We start again with calling topics until there are no topics more to call. And if we have the right one, then we go to the fourth, the fourth stop, and then we make a, a, a circle. Um, and that we do by the DCPI method from the plan, do, check, and act method. So we have the goal. The goal has to be smart. Everyone knows the term smart, I think. Eh? Um, normally, you go to the to the to do, what we started to do control. How is you going to measure the things you are, things specifically needed, the calls? So how going to, uh, when do you going to check? What do you want to check? 
what's going to be and what's the range? Als we afwijken. Deviation. 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 What range of deviation? Okay. Because that's the only way you can make it realistic and time and in a timeline. Because otherwise they are going to do the deep dive. So and then it's there is no point. You can they have no um, the wheel in hand. And if you have to do the, the control, then we go to the do by flowchart, who is doing what, when has to be ready, then we do it by the by the do. And then they're gonna We'll go in. and in the project, in the project we go uh, four, five times. We are in the table, with Palmer. So most of the times I have three or four uh, of these circles we make because then that's the much focus they can have. Otherwise, they are then you're sitting two, three hours in conversation. That's a very long time, and then they are off. They are then off. Are there questions? Very difficult for me. <laughs> no? Okay, thanks. Good luck. No, uh, uh, thanks a lot, Gemma, uh, for this practical example of how it works in practice. Um, for us also as attractive to see uh, and to take with us in our case studies. So now I promised that I would also give some examples that it shows that it can work, and especially the farm-specific approach of the creating farm-specific action plans to improve uh, farms. So um, I will not start with scientific publications. We will start with a real-life example from practice um, from a farmer who was involved in a uh, reductions of antibiotics project uh, from Ghent University uh, and we, we had a farmer happy to share a video testimony with us which we filmed and which we would like to share with you um, on what he achieved working in this way. Oh wait, sorry. Um, Sorry for the ticket.
we will uh, enter into discussion later on. Uh, please uh, keep in mind uh, what you want to discuss about. It will be very interesting. The film is ready, so let's have a second look at it. Uh, my sincere apologies also for the people following online for the second, um, but we'll give it another go. My name is Bart Verhoeven. I've been uh, since October 2010 Varkenschooler. My bedrijf is Lee in uh, Westfalen in Zedegem. Ik heb het bedrijf overgenomen in die periode van mijn ouders. Uh, mijn moeder was, was Varkenschooler en had eigenlijk een open bedrijf verkocht bij hen, van uh, 300 zeugen en uh, plaats voor uh, zelfs een verkeersplaats. Ik heb uh, sindsdien een bedrijf uitgevoerd waar een groot varkensbedrijf van uh, 280 zeugen en eigenlijk tot 2800 vleesvarkens plaatsen. Ik heb eigenlijk besloten om uh, dan aan het Red AD project deel te nemen, om eigenlijk te kijken waar ik op mijn bedrijf uh, kon gaan uh, werken of actie gaan ondernemen om het van te gebruiken. Dat doe ik met de klant. In het verleden was het eigenlijk als buurtkaart. We moeten daar eerlijk in zijn, als burka werd eigenlijk gewoon als de makkelijkste oplossing gebruikt op het bedrijf. Alle bijen werden eigenlijk standaard in de batterijperiode, 20 tot 20 kilo, werden standaard naar burka geheven om geen problemen te gaan krijgen. Um, hoe is dat aangepakt? Dus uh, meneer Postma en de twee professoren Jeroen de Wolf en Dominique Maas zijn enkele keren langs geweest om eerst en vooral het uh, bedrijf te leren kennen. Hoe dat nu in zijn werk ging, oh, 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 in 2010, hoe dat het dan nog in zijn werk ging. Um, Welke antwoorden had dat er standaard toegediend werd? En werd er eigenlijk gekeken, uh, werden er actiepunten opgesteld? Wat hebben we allemaal ondernomen? En dat was um, rookmetingen op het bedrijf. Dus alle stallen werden eigenlijk onderworpen aan een rookmeting om te kijken hoe dat de stal verluchting, niet de verlichting, de verluchting van het stal eigenlijk plaatsvond. Um, en werden daar ook batterijen aan gekoppeld. Zo heb ik in mijn batterijperiode als batterijen uh, moeten mijn ventilatiesysteem gaan aanpassen. Dus dan dat het ventilatie heel slecht was. En ook zijn we van drie weken en een half spelen naar vier weken gegaan. Dus wel deel ik een drie weken systeem, maar dan van drie weken en een half naar vier weken. Uh, heeft een hele grote impuls naar uh, zijn ietsjes waarde tot te brengen. We uh, kunnen ook al veel meer zelfstandig voedsel of voeder gaan opnemen. Zijn weer barder uh, resistent tegen ziektes en half. Ook naar uh, vaccinaties toe is het ietsje zelfvoeder. Maar natuurlijk heeft dat een gevolg naar uh, je zeugen gaan een half week langer melk geven, waardoor dat ze ietsje mager uit de kraan komen. Ook, uh, ook uh, hebben we ook uh, het water uh, geanalyseerd om te zien of er daar eventueel problemen waren. Dat bleek enorm te zijn. Ook het voeder werd uh, onderworpen aan, uh, ja, aan grote testen, dat er geen uh, tekortkomingen in het voeder aanwezig waren, of dan we konden kijken om daar een toevoeging te gaan doen. Uh, dus eigenlijk heel bedrijf werd eigenlijk bekeken van uh, waar kunnen we op elk punt iets gaan ondernemen. Ook heel veel heeft werd bekeken. Um, aanvoer, afvoer, loonlijnen, ook naar onweertebestrijding. Dat zit hier, dat zat en dat zit altijd hier goed. Uh, rendak werd dan bekeken op de, op de kalaveropvalling. Ergens anders konden ook af, afvoeren van zeuren, meer in groepen laten afvoeren. Uh, vleesvarkens was al, op dit, al, over zoveel jaar ook al volle vracht was, dus daar konden we niets meer aan ondernemen. Ook het aankoop van zeuren, ik doe misschien wel niet aan één aanvoer, maar kan in groepen, grote groepen zeuren gaan aankopen van verschillende leeftijden, werd dan ook uh, geadviseerd om die die druk eigenlijk bij het aankopen of bij het leveren gaan verminderen. Dus allerhande zaken werden eigenlijk bekeken. Toen ik het bedrijf overnam, was er eigenlijk een standaard toeding van antibiotica. Uh, we zijn eigenlijk gekomen tot een antibiotica gebruik enkel bij individuele behandeling van de dieren. Enkel problemen bij beggen worden nog, uh, wordt er nog antibiotica toegedeeld. Uh, eigenlijk een standaard van de dieren individueel te gaan behandelen. Het is natuurlijk iets meer werk. Um, maar zorgt er wel voor dat eigenlijk de dieren die het eigenlijk nodig hebben, het enkel maar toe die ze krijgen en niet de andere dieren. Na een jaar of twee begon ik eigenlijk te zien aan hoe leid je toe wanneer je een antibiogram doet of iets uh, van bepaalde bloedstallen of maagstallen, dat er eigenlijk ook de antibiotica weer uh, toepasbaar is. En dat kan ik eigenlijk 
weer gaan inzetten. En wat dan ook uh, zien is uh, darmgezondheid. We zien eigenlijk dat de darmen gezonder zijn, waardoor eigenlijk over het algemeen een gezonder hart Een externe koers is heel handig of heel nuttig om uh, de routines te gaan breken. Want een, een, een dierenarts die wekelijks op, of iedere twee, drie weken langs komt, zit jij bij je vaste stramien op je bedrijf. En het is niemand die eigenlijk dat doorziet. En die externe coach zal wel een keer andere zaken gaan kunnen inbrengen of uh, aankaarten van, van pak dat er op die manier aan of, of op een andere manier. Het is heel belangrijk dat, dat uh, goede leveranciers, dierenartsen, ook wat je hier kan aankoopt, op een regelmatige tijdstip toch samen zitten of toch uh, elkaars adviezen gaan uh, onderhandelen gaan nemen of gaan bekijken en zelf een mening gaan of oordelen. Ik denk dat dat wel een meerwaarde heeft. Wanneer dat iedereen de adviezen van elkaar gaat bekijken, kun je gaan inspelen op problemen op het bedrijf. En door iedereen zijn mening te gaan horen, kun je wel dingen gaan aanpassen. Dus ik denk dat dat heel belangrijk is. Zeker uh, als je dus dat die taal, dan zal je wel geconfronteerd worden met bepaalde oorzaken of, of, of zaken die andere keer uit de kop opsteken. En samen kun je er wel iets aan doen. Een externe coach bij het betaalgeronde van de dierenarts en goede leverancier en varkenschouder gaat heel duidelijk meerwaarde hebben. Omdat je als varkenschouder nog altijd in, in de positie zit van je kunt geen kant kiezen op momenten. En je bent eigenlijk te weinig ingelegd van wie dat gelijk heeft. Welke advies ik zou wel meegeven is durf antibiotica te doen. Nou, we veel antibiotica wordt toegediend gewoon uit de routine. Om zeker te zien dat er geen problemen zouden zijn in de toekomst of, of uh, in, in die leeftijdscategorieën. Uh, ik ben ervan overtuigd dat dat wel kan. En eigenlijk op zoek gaan ook naar een neutraal advies, tweede lijns advies, uh, om eigenlijk bedrijfsblindheid van u en uw dierenarts waarschijnlijk op het bedrijf te gaan doorbreken. Thank you very much. Nice uh, video. We have another uh, speaker. Do you want to uh, reflect on this uh, video first? It was a bit shocking that he uh, admitted that he was really um, supplying antibiotics like uh, a routine, wasn't it? And I'm, lo I'm looking at the professor, Jeroen, you were involved in this uh, case. Can you uh, very briefly give your reaction on the results? Yeah, well, uh, this was uh, the herd of uh, Bart was one of was one of the uh, one of the sixty herds in that project which we have uh, uh, guided uh, towards reduced antimicrobial usage on average. Uh, in these sixty herds, we were able to reduce the usage with more than fifty percent in, uh, in in less than one year. Uh, so in some it was more, in others it was less. But what is, uh, what is even more important is that on the majority of these farms, and, and especially Bart is, is, a, is a farmer who is very uh, innovative. innovative and he's also very communicative, uh, so it's, it's easy to talk with him and he's also willing to share his, uh, his, uh, uh, his ideas and, and uh, to give testimonials. But what, after we stopped our coaching, because it was a one-year tra trajectory like, like in, the, in the DISA project, <laughs> He, he simply continued. We, we gave him a push and we uh, pointed a certain direction and he, he, got, he got a feeling for it and then he, he continued his efforts and he continues to contact us with some, some small questions or suggestions or he contacted him. But, but it really is not, and, and for me that's very important that it is a sustainable change. It's not a temporary during the period, you know, the coach is there, they do a bit better, and once, once the coach is gone, uh, it, it laps back, which was truly not the case in, in, in this farm. And on the majority of the farms where we have been able to continue the, the contact, uh, we, we have seen this long-lasting effect, which is for me uh, very important. So, coaching helps. That's my conclusion. Friedrich. Uh, thank you. Um, so, this was a, an example from practice. Jeroen touched upon the projects he was involved in. 
So the results of these projects have also been published, and a colleague of ours with colleagues from the University of Ghent showed really in a scientific valid approach that um, doing this, working on preventive measures and on re disease prevention and biosecurity can uh, improve your farm to the extent that not only cutting the use of antibiotics will not hamper your performance and your technical results and your economic performance, but can even improve um, your performance technically and economically. Um, considering the time, I will not go into very much detail on these studies, but there is another study also from the people from Ghent University on the effects of herd specific interventions uh, to reduce antimicrobial using pig protection without just jeopardizing the results. These, uh, these scientific publications can be found on our website as well, um, so I invite you to, to look uh, into them. And there is also an example from, um, from dairy farming, from David Spexner, from Utrecht University, who um, did his thesis also on the structural health planning uh, approach and showed the potentials of this approach for improving farms and cutting the use of antibiotics. Um, so then I would like to also invite the next external speaker to the session. Um, we're also privileged to have him over. It's um, Tommy van Limberg, general manager from uh, Stad, and it's the company which we will be involved in the poultry production sector to uh, make the case studies happen uh, with, um, with uh, the data they collect on the farms. Uh, and so we're delighted that he will give a talk also from his perspective and his, his experience on how important data are to motivate farmers and make a change happen. Tommy, thanks for being here on time. and. Good luck with presentation we're looking for. So thank you, Frederick, for this kind of introduction. Also, thank you for uh, inviting me as a speaker for this uh, very um, interesting audience. It's the first time I can speak uh, in the building of Fort Coheca, so it's, it's really one thing to add to my uh, to, um, put out my bucket list. That's so <laughs> very nice. Um, so as uh, Frederick already told, um, I'm working in, uh, in poultry. I have um, poultry veterinarian, worked as poultry and pig veterinarian before. And now I'm based on this part of a group of uh, veterinary companies in Belgium, Netherlands, and France. And I'm uh, based on this basically um, um, operating in the data management parts, the data analysis of this group, and also a certain field trials we operate ourselves within the test of. So basically, from what the group on, we already um, uh, found that the use of data is the start of everything. If you have a number, for sure in poultry, if you can collect a number, you can try to improve it. So I think with the um, general, um, it's general idea also applicable for um, uh, antibiotic usage. If you have a number, you start measuring, you can start to improve it. So I think also that's what AMCRA um, has been doing in, uh, in Belgium. But we use this um, data collection for our primary client. Our primary client is the poultry farmer. And we try to improve his production process. So there are three main priorities for data processing for poultry vets. It's first poultry industry. Secondly, it's veterinary guidance programs. As you can see, the effect of certain vaccines. For sure, for sure if you have certain regions um, in one type of vaccine schedule and other regions and other uh, vaccine schedules, you can compare those things and see um, if certain trends arise. Yeah, we can adapt protocols depending on what's happening. For example, if you have um, an outbreak of a certain type of virus in, in the northern part of your area, you can adapt vaccination schedules to avoid getting it to the southern part of your area. So those things you can do um, if you have the, not enough data. And the third part is the use of this uh, in, uh, in research. So we are also very happy to be involved in the Disarm uh, farm visits in Belgium. So four out of five um, farms will be um, farms under our care. So we are very closely um, involved in this project also. So PayStop, basically we collect a lot of data. So PayStop is an integrated database. So we just bring all the data together. Um, we collect data from management and housing via our veterinary companies. 
uh, we have a special apps to collect uh, certain health data. We score a lot of things. We score uh, locomotory diseases, we score empirical diseases, we score respiratory diseases, and the tablets of our vets. So we have 32 vets in the field, and none of them is using paper. All of them are using tablets. Everything is uh, going very uh, digital and very dramatically. And then the part of the uh, performance we collect via the farm. The farm has to agree. The farm steps into this um, process also. And we collect this via a specific um, farm specific software. And like I said, the output, uh, where do you use it for? Mainly to make our farms better. So we look for things that we can change um, on those farms. Benchmarking, benchmarking farmers, seeing how they are uh, and compared to, um, to their colleagues. And uh, yeah, also to set up certain uh, food types. So what is our impact in Belgium? So we have about 70% of the dog farms in our care in our system, about 90% of the laying hens and almost all breeders. So this is quite interesting because we have to take into account that Belgium is a non-integrated, has a non-integrated food industry. So our farmers, they can have two types of hatcheries, they can have two brands of feed companies. Um, so this makes it very interesting to collect data in a, a world, uh, in a setting in which it is very difficult to collect data. Um, in an integrated setting, integrators, they know more about those farms than uh, if you would be in a non-integrated setting. So the importance of data, yeah, so what can you do? So we have started collecting data, in this case, about antibiotic usage, starting from farms since 2011. This is a group of 52 farms. And this year, 2019, if I take the first three quarters of this year, and um, we have a 51% reduction of antibiotic usage compared to 2011 in broilers. Mm -hmm. This is quite uh, they're quite happy uh, with this. So it's still are waiting for the last quarter, but like I've seen the numbers of, of November already and October, and I think it is quite stable. So we will end up with a 51% reduction. And growers mainly do do our impacts or our um, activities to reduce the use of amoxicillin in broilers. Amoxicillin was the main um, antibiotic used um, in higher quantities and higher volumes. It's also an important one for human health. So uh, we had quite some um, attention for this. And we changed quite some things also for gut uh, health and uh, locomotory health. So this is, uh, I will skip, um, skip this slide. So basically what we do is we try to um, put the entire production process in numbers. To really understand what's happening and what's happening in, in the, the process of making um, produce, of making producing eggs, of making um, chicks or in the rearing parts, what's our goal, what are our, our standards. And then we <coughs> identify the problems, but not only by seeing how much they are treated or what treatments they get, but also to see within the flock. When do they start to lose appetites? When do when are the, um, the water consumption is going down? When do we see certain uh, things in our monitoring scheme? And how can we interact? So basically, we make um, farm reports based on the data of these farms <laughs> with a benchmark next to it. And this is being discussed with farm veterinarians, the farmer, and what the farmer wants uh, who the farmer wants to be present also. So it's basically the setup of what's being done in the field trials with, uh, with this arm, which we are implementing in our um, uh, mode of action in the, the veterinary companies in, uh, in, our, um, in our group. So this makes it for us very interesting, a very interesting project. We can do a lot of things with data. Uh, the first thing to make it um, the first interesting thing for farmers is just to make it visually. We have a phone call. Mm -hmm. <laughs> cool. So the first thing I think what's already very interesting for farmers is just to make it, to visualize it, 
to see what's happening. And um, one example is here, and you could see that this, uh, if you don't know the farmer, you would say it's a, the, um, I would first give a few words of explanation. So the um, graph the, on the mid is the daily feed intake, and the graph on top is the daily water intake on one farm with three broiler houses. So you see three lines, all representing one house at the flock. They all have the same age. It's an all-in, all-out system in Brothers and Belgium. And you see that at day four, you see a, a, a severe decrease in water intake. You could say, okay, this is a problem. Something happens. Uh, we should check the lines and we should check uh, what's, what's happened. But in this case, it's a very good farm and it does it on purpose. He adapts his lighting schedule to lower down the chicks a bit because he knows that if I let them go, the burners, the Ross 308 or the COP 500, if you, those modern hybrids, if you let them go, they will go too fast and they will grow too fast. You have to hit the brakes a bit with those brothers. And this is the, the, the finger spits and buffoon that the, that the best farmers have. And that you also learn by looking at the, their own data. Why do you do such things? Uh, what's the reason for this? So those things are very interesting to, um, to take into uh, consideration. The next one was just by visualizing his data that we saw what happened. So this is daily mortality for day 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34. And um, it is made relative. So it is daily mortality per day. Our, um, so it is 0.03% per day of the flock. So for example, you can see 0.004. It's five buildings. And the data you see is seven flocks per building. So you see quite a lot of data on this few days of, of, uh, of information. What we can see is that everything is quite stable during day 28, 29, and 30. And uh, starting on day 31, you can see that the house number 3, 4, and 5 have an increased mortality rate. Now, if I can give you some background information, number house, house number 1 and 2 is 25,000 birds per house, uh, about 20 years old. House number three and four is 40,000 birds per house, so it's about 15 years old. And house number five has 60,000 birds old. What we see here is a ventilation problem. Our minimum ventilation was too low. So, and what we have is this is the days just before thinning. We are reaching 42 kilograms per square meter. It's the highest density in the flock you can have. And this is just the setting in the computer. So it was adapted, it was changed, and he had much lower mortality in the flocks which we came after. So if you calculate his benefit from this for 2017, it's about 830 birds that he loses less yeah, just before the finish, because 35 days is the finish for uh, some of the birds, and it became better. I have to speed up a little bit. Um, another example. It's nothing to do with antibiotics, but it was a nice one to, uh, to do. We also had um, quite some efforts in adapting light schedules for laying hands. And in this case, you can see it was a very good farm. You can see the lowest line is the, um, the norm of the breed, and the standard of the breed. And the top two lines, the red one and the blue one, are the real production at the farm. Um, so both lines are on top of the, of the norm. But um, where the arrow is, we changed something in one house and not in the other. The light adaptation in the type of light. If we look into this in detail, at the end of slaughter, this was a difference of eight eggs per hen. At a farm with 100,000 laying hens, um, in this case, it was a net margin for the farm of about 6,400 euros. So it's also by looking into detail into numbers and making improvements. You can not only um, decrease antibiotic usage, like I said before already, but also try to increase uh, margin for your farm. Um, another example here. Um, this is basically a number of rearing flocks. All of our flocks get a number, as you can see down, uh, down below. It's uh, from layer plants. And you can see I've not all um, 
uh, reading flux which had a an, an, um, mortality rate of more than 3%, which is far too much for reading flux, right? So much too much, uh, too much. In this case, for this, uh, the guidance of this layering integration, we went to detail. And this was um, an adaptation for the anti uh programs. So we just by having some more detail um, of that and to monitor this a bit more, we could see that these farms with a higher mortality rate, those also involved um, um, higher um, parasitic problems. So for sure, it's, uh, those leading hands um, uh, have to go outside. We also encounter this type of problems. Here you can see that this is um, daily uh, water, daily feed intake, yes, daily, uh, weekly feed intake in laying hands. And you can see clearly what the effect is of the vaccination. So they are injected at those days. Um, and you can see the arrows. So what we do with the animals clearly has an effect on their production. So it's um, something to take into account. One of the key items we uh, had a lot of attention on and, and still have is uh, coxidiosis. So I think the main part of our benefits in, in the reduction of antibiotic usage and for sure the redu reduction of amoxicillin was due to our uh, approach in dealing with those uh, farms that have severe problems with coxidiosis and area problems. It's a quite a problem, a terrible problem in, uh, in broilers where we um, started first in monitoring we still do a lot of monitoring in, in, uh, in broilers. And we start to vaccinate some flocks and do a an, um, rotation scheme with anticoxidules in flocks which had severe problems with coxidules. Uh, now, which type of farms do you vaccinate? You don't vaccinate a farm which has very good performance results. Uh, those farms, they have uh, normally very low problems with coxidules. Uh, so you only vaccinate those farms which have uh, issues. And um, you can see some examples. You can see some anaeria on the top um, figure. Below, you can see species, which is not very good. It's too, uh, it's too wet. And you can see disease bird. Now, in the end, we ended up with, um, in those farms which we vaccinated, on those flocks, we took more than 30% reduction of antibiotic usage. So this could be one of the things to address also during uh, this one. I will skip uh, this one, but I will only go to uh, this slide. We want to go to this one. This was a, a larger um, um, research in a European project called ProHealth, where we looked for risk factors for bad production, for poor performance. And these are some things in those seven countries, uh, at least 50 uh, farms per country, which were clearly significantly present uh, and different between farms that had good or bad performance results. You can see in housing, floor quality, certain types of ventilation, the type of light at loading, um, intensity of the light during the flock, um, of course, the presence of certain infectious diseases as an influence. Um, but also we saw that the level of professionalism was one of the things that came out of the analysis as making good producing farmers um, different from less good producing farms. So um, I think coaching, educating farmers clearly has, uh, has a benefit uh, if you look at this. Um, so in, uh, to conclude, data collection is the start of everything. It's when, for sure in poultry, but also in other animal species, when you start to collect, when you, when you give as a number, we try to improve it. That's something I, I, I like to say to farmers, and you can, uh, yeah, you have to start. You can start to use this, and you can start to build up a much larger, much integrated uh, data set. For example, one of the things we also do is we collect or we link to data sets of hatcheries, um, and we can make a link between reading flocks, between um, breeder flocks. We can go much more into detail in guiding this type of, uh, of farms and this type of uh, farms. So this was my uh, best wish. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Tommy von Limbergen, who is into a cup of coffee.
Let's have uh, the coffee break. Uh, one quarter of an hour. So I expect you to be uh, back at uh, four ten. Ten past four.
Is Alice already in the room? Okay, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, this is the last part of this workshop. We have one presentation of, uh, let's say, one quarter of an hour from France, from Paris, the Livestock Research Institute, IPD. Um, I present to you Alizé Chouteau. Please, you have to talk. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm very glad to be here today with you. Um, I am here to talk to you about the work of the second work package of the design project, which uh, is to build and to facilitate a community of practice that we'll talk about. Um, I am working on this work package with uh, all of the colleagues in the design project, and uh, mostly with uh, one French colleague of mine, which is Amandine Monet, who cannot be there today. Um, okay, so I will. Um, uh, you have seen this presentation a few times already today, so I will not uh, go through it uh, all along. But uh, so the community of practice is kind of the center of the design, community, the design project. Uh, the point is to create a community of actors involved in livestock farming all across Europe. Uh, the idea of this community of practice is to be able to have discussions about good practices regarding uh, antibiotic resistance. Um, and this community of practice is um, connected with the other work package. And we will see at the end of this presentation how the community of practice will be helped or will help the other work package. So the design community of practice is a growing community. Right now, uh, I checked Friday, we had 238 members from all across Europe. We also have some members outside of Europe, so people from all around the world and want to connect to this community of practice. Um, today, around half of the people, of the members inside the community of practice are veterinarian and researchers. So our ambition is to have more and more members and more and more farmers inside the members. Um, so those actors come from all, um, all the sectors studied inside the project. Um, for now, as I said, we have more than 200 members and the, the point is to reach 600 members at the end of the project.
So the objective of, of the community of practice is to catalyze the exchanges, uh, cooperation, and dissemination of good practice between uh, its members. So what we want is to have uh, our community of members to discuss um, using their experience, uh, their knowledge, um, around, for example, research results, uh, innovation from farmers or industry, for example, or testimonies regarding strategies and the results on farms. So we had a few examples uh, earlier today. Um, so to do so, we chose 10 subjects of interest we wanted to study more. So those 10 subjects were chosen asking the COP members and the, and the members of the Consortium of Design. And it will be 10 subjects we will be studying in more detail inside the community of practice. So here you have the 10, uh, the 10 subjects that were chosen. Uh, the, the first subject that were um, uh, mostly chosen by most of the people we asked for was the subject of biosecurity. So we decided to have two subjects uh, regarding biosecurity, which are internal biosecurity and external biosecurity. We also have a topic regarding housing for healthy animals and less stressed animals. Um, a topic regarding precising livestock technologies for early disease detection. Um, another one regarding potential breeding and genetics for robust and resilient animals. Um, um, a subject regarding control of drinking uh, water from quality, regarding young stock management and uh, rearing, vaccination protocol, uh, the antibiotic management in extensive livestock system, and the last one is regarding improving animal health by using adapted feeding, watering, and feed additives. So, the, um, right now, the topics that are discussed inside the community of practice are the two first topics, as uh, the community have many members, but it's still a very, very young community of practice. So for now, we decided to focus on two subjects, but uh, starting December, we will uh, we'll start discussing all the subjects <coughs> on the screen. So at the beginning of the project, we were wondering which tool uh, should we use to build uh, our online community, uh, because we wanted to have a community that is, uh, as Frederick and Ewan said, um, a living community, but also having um, an online tool for the community to discuss. So we decided uh, to, uh, to create this online community on a tool which is Facebook. Uh, we chose this uh, tool because um, it is easy to join and to use uh, at the same time for the members and for the moderation. Um, there is also a translation tool that is integrated in, inside Facebook, so it's not a perfect translation tool, but it's uh, still doing the job. Um, and uh, we were seeing another uh, positive aspect, which was um, you, the member didn't need to have another account on another website if they were already using Facebook. Uh, so the idea is there will be a monthly review each month um, with uh, what happened inside this online community of practice uh, that will be put on the design website. Uh, in order for everyone, including the ones that are not on Facebook, to see uh, what happens and what were discussed inside the community of practice. So, to see uh, what the COP will be used for, let's take an example. If, for example, a farmer has an idea or a question, maybe some another farmer inside Europe can have a solution to this question, for example. So the idea inside this community of practice is to find some other people who can uh, give a new idea, new solution to share with uh, other actor of the of the list of livestock sector. Um, so I was talking about farmers, but as we said all, all day long, those actors can also be vets, industry actor, researcher, etc. So the idea is to um, for all these actors to meet inside the community of practice and to discuss uh, their good ideas, their good practice, their experiences, uh, their success, or uh, times where things didn't work as well as they wanted to be, and why. Um, and the idea is that the content created uh, inside the COP, or by uh, the other work packages of this community, can be used for dissemination in school, in farm action, etc. 
So inside the community of practice, the idea is that members can share ideas, um, expenses completely freely. So you have here a few examples of uh, some posts already made on the COP. Um, so inside this, uh, this online tool, the, there are a, a great number of possibilities way of sharing ideas. So you can share videos, testimonies, etc. Um, and to make sure the, the community of practice uh, and is active and to stimulate the discussion, all the members of the design project have a mission. This mission is to, um, to stimulate the activity and facilitate the discussion. And to do so, they propose some activities uh, to the member of the community of practice. Um, so we choose to have one kind of activity each day of the week. So Monday, it's a study Monday. So study Monday is when you share, for example, results of a new study, which is interesting regarding antibiotic resistance. Question Tuesday is the day when you ask questions to the COP members. So it can be a poll, it can be an open question. And the idea is to share uh, some, uh, some opinion regarding one special question. Um, on Wednesday, we focus on testimonies and stories, success stories, for example. Uh, on Thursday, we talk about uh, Make It Easy Thursday, which can be checklists or um, uh, some uh, uh, advice regarding how to manage antibiotic resistance on farm, for example. On Friday, you can uh, put uh, what kind of activity you want. And uh, during the weekend, uh, the idea is to relax. So uh, it is a place when you can share some fun uh, activities because, uh, well, it's, uh, it's better to discuss in a fun environment sometimes. So the idea is uh, every one of you are welcome inside the COP. Um, so to do so, uh, if you want to join, it's quite simple. So the QR code here are quite experimental, so you will tell me if it works. Um, so to join the COP, you will need to do two things. The first one is to complete an online subscription form. So we will ask you for your name, your job, your sector, your country. Uh, this um, this uh, form is used for us to um, to uh, to follow how many users we have of each country. Uh, I'm searching for the right word, but yes, it's uh, yeah, it's just for for us to follow. And another in, uh, important part is to for you to validate the moderation rules. So we make sure the rules are clear for everyone, and everyone agrees with the rules we fix uh, earlier. Um, and then we need to make a request on the Facebook group. And once you have done both, uh, some administrator, it can be me or my, my colleague Amadin, Amandine, uh, you will be added inside the group in a few days. And once you are in, you can start sharing, sharing and commenting with the other members. So as a member, you can do a lot of things. Uh, most of it, I just say to you, is to share new ideas, share good practices, but uh, please feel free to ask questions if you have some um, suggestions, and to comment and give your opinion uh, to the to the posts that are already there. It's uh, the point of the community of practice is to share your opinions uh, and uh, good advice. Uh, inside the COP, so you have members, but you also have a whole team of facilitators and moderators. Uh, it's uh, the members of the design consortium that are here to give also an expert answer, to take note of the good ideas and to develop uh, um, to develop during the project that can be used inside the other work package we talked about. So during, for example, for the state of the art for the database or for the the, uh, the work package for regarding the the, the funds. Um, and uh, the, the role of the facilitators, moderators, and administrators is also to summarize the discussion for dissemination outside the COP. So as I said earlier, we come back to this, uh, to this slide. Uh, so the point of the COP is also to, um, to give some input to the other work package, like the database on the left on, uh, for the on farm. Um, and uh, it can go the other way. It means that the, the state of the art can also provide some interesting facts to share inside the COP. So all the all the work package uh, worked uh, work together. 
I hope uh, my English was not too hard to follow. Uh, please feel free to ask questions if you have to. Um, I think I'm good. Now, I would uh, thank you very much. We can enter into details uh, during the discussion. I would like to ask uh, to come forward Edgar Garcia Manzanilla and uh, also Jules van Broeke. We can start the discussion. Where is Edgar? Edgar, we have already a seat there. We will need to share our microphone. It's really hard to work. Does somebody have a have his mic? Oh yes, yeah. this uh, this is working. Okay. Um, good afternoon. We have one hour to discuss with you. I'm very sorry. Normally, as moderator, I run through the room and I come to you. Now, due to the fact that we have uh, this webinar taken, and uh, to the fact that we need to have uh, our microphones working. I need to sit here. My first question to the panelists is a double question. Why do you think you are here? Can you explain that to us? I mean, what expertise do you bring to this table to have the discussion about um, is this a good plan to try to reduce the use of antibiotics in livestock so that at the end of the day, we will um, influence the amount of resistance going on in society. This is first question. And then, was there something in the presentations you heard that really struck you and that you want to comment on? Please, one thing, no, not three things. And I give uh, the word to uh, Jeroen to start it. Thank you. Um... So why I'm here, uh, that's simply because I was invited to be here. Yes, <laughs> of course but you were I, invited. Uh, uh, if I guess why I was you're, invited. You're a professor. Yes, uh, I'm, I've been working on the, on the topic of reduction of antimicrobial uses and resistance for for many years. Uh, and we've done, yeah, some of the work was presented already. So so we've done quite some work. I'm also involved in this ARM project. So I'm, I'm a member of the, of the project. So. Uh, so it was also a cost-cutting issue, I presume. Uh, um, but but I'm, I'm I'm very I'm very happy uh, to be here. Um, and I think in, within within the project, I, I or my group, so I'm, I'm for sure I'm not not the only one. Uh, but with, with our group, we can bring some some expertise from from previous studies we've done on this, and some uh, some academic insights uh, that that is I think uh, our added value. I know already that you are a believer of this kind of approach. What was striking you in what you heard? Yeah, well, I'm 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 very much a believer in this approach. We've been, I think, uh, on the in the front of, of developing this, and we we continuously doing so. We had a, a workshop yesterday afternoon on on novel approaches uh, to work with this. Uh, so I I strongly believe in in this approach. Um, what has struck me in, in this is um, not so much about the explanation because since I'm in the project, there's a lot I've seen before. But I want to, uh, and I've seen it also a little bit as my role in, in this consortium is to uh, to challenge the status quo from time to time and maybe to to try to push uh, everybody a little bit further. And, and to do so again in this discussion, I want to I want to come back to this issue as little as needed, as much as necessary. And and the people within the consortium will remember that uh, um, Friedrich made an uh, allusion to it that we discussed in the beginning, or, or uh, Edwin, that we discussed in the beginning a lot about what is the team. Team, and there was a lot of discussion: Do we need to reduce antimicrobial usage, or do we have to go for responsible antimicrobial usage? Um, and I made a very strong case for reduction. Um, and today I'm going to make a strong case against this uh, sentence as little as needed and as much as necessary. It is too prudent? Well, it, it doesn't tell me anything. 
and, okay. and it doesn't speak to anybody, I believe, because every veterinarian you'll ask and every farmer you'll ask will tell you he's using as little as possible and as much as necessary. Okay. Because there is no... You want the quantitative goal? Then? Yes. I want, I, I truly want, I want reduction. The word reduction needs to be in the message. And we, we not yet, unless you're coming from Norway or Iceland, um, we not yet uh, there, we not yet in a stage where we can say reduction is no longer an, an aim. Uh, we, we are at the, at the absolute, absolute lowest possible <laughs> level. Um, so, so I'm really, um, uh, and this is, I mean, I understand where it comes from and I understand the challenges and I'm certainly not the one who's trying to force or brutalize the industry in towards uh, stupid uh, reduction. Uh, in. So we want, I, I'm very open to discussing the speed at which you have to reduce, but I think the reduction is a, is a goal. It's a must. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was a clear statement to start with. I go to my uh, neighbor, Joost van den Broeke. You are from a, a consumer association in Belgium. Test test Why are you here? And what is your statement? I'm here. I will be honest. I think that I'm here because it's always good in European projects. And in your to dossier, no, to have the consumer, to have the citizen involved. Okay. <laughs> what do you want to tell us? So and I, you... But I will be more positive. We as consumer organization, it's a topic we work hard on. And we are very okay. interested in because it's in all our mm -hmm. interest that antibiotics stay available 25,000 a year deaths in Europe and growing. So it's a major problem for all of us. And that's why we are interested in. I heard, I see this project and I like it, but I heard what struck me most in it, one point, the, the carrot and stick. This project is very carrot because it's self-monitoring, it's self-working. And we want to seduce, to seduce Farmers, yes, and it's self-organizing, uh, it's putting themselves their goals. But we, we learned we have the um, important project in Belgium, Amuka. Yes. My colleague knows very well, he's the boss of it, I think. And there in the beginning, they worked that way also. And we saw there was little effect. It was only after two years when the government decided hard measures, hard fingers, that we, saw, that we saw results really happening. So don't forget the carrot, the stick. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Nice statement. Uh, let me go to David John from the Animal Health Europe. Tell me something about yourself and what was striking you the most? Okay. I think, yeah, we're here because at the end of the day, uh, the antibiotics are our products. Um, we have an interest in their ongoing use. Okay? Responsible use is some of our products is something we've been advocating for many years. We were a founder member along with some of the other organizations in this room at the European platform for responsible use of medicines in animals. And we would like to go on. It costs a lot of money to develop the veterinary medicine a lot of time. So obviously we would like to keep on having those available for the farmers to use for as long as possible. And I think what struck me about this is where we're talking about behavior. Because I think the most frightening words for any organization or business is when you ask a question and the answer comes back, because we've always done it that way. And I think trying to change behavior is difficult, but it can be done. And I think for the design project is working from the bottom up, encouraging farmers, changing behavior, changing the management systems, really is the best long-term way to affect that change. Thank you, David. Um, I go to Edgar Manzilla. Ed, Manzanilla, sorry. Edgar, uh, from Tugas. Yeah. Livestock production is huge in Ireland. Tell me. 
Why are you here and what do you want to, to emphasize? Uh, why am I here? Uh, quite honest answer to the person who was invited to the con. And, and now, now that I see the list, actually I was thinking about something that because my wife keeps telling me this. I have to do the remark. Was the only woman in the list, and now we are for men, so it would be next time. Exactly, two, good. Two point. women, two men would be better next time. So, yes, share the message from my wife. Point taken. Uh, Why well, are here? Well, because I'm a, uh, the, the living proof, or we are the living proof that what he is promoting is, is totally possible to export it to another country and, and use it and it works because we, we literally took his method and we bring it to, to Ireland to the point that it's probably even more developed than in his own country because it's part of our uh, quality scheme. So from probably February, all the farmers, big farmers in, in Ireland will have to have the bio check done. Mm -hmm. And it worked very well. And and the method with the, with the group of everybody integrated in the discussion, we send a student over there, copy it exactly the method and it works. So we still don't have the number, we, we will next year. And the reduction is very good and it, it works very well. Uh, something to, to remark, I was I will actually remark the question from, I don't know, somebody who was it, but it say, are you going to be able to do it in two years? It's not that we are going to be able to do it. We have to do it in two years because the new legislation is here in two years for the same and the, and the animal health. So we have to do it, not that we will. OK. I'm looking to you. I have some questions prepared, but I promised you to uh, uh, involve you as much as possible. Um, so, what was striking you in the stories that were told this afternoon? And where do you want to put some critical or positive or proactive or amendments, whatever? I'm looking to you. Who wants to take the words? Who are you, sir, and what do you want to remark? Hello, well, yeah, I'm Richard Lord from Innovation for Agriculture. I just want to pick up your carrot and stick discussion that the panel have started. And I'd like to comment, certainly in the UK, from figures that were produced by the response, well, by the UK government, but backed by the responsible use of medicines in agriculture, that showed that we have, with the carrot and industry approach, without any government uh, regulation, uh, achieved a 53% reduction in antibiotic use on UK livestock from 2014 to 2018. With that in mind, on the carrot plus, I'd like to ask the panel, what other, in their experience, what other benefits are there for the farmers that have reduced antibiotic use, apart from the fact that they have reduced it and the cost of the antibiotics? In your experience, what other benefits have those farmers found? Okay. Beneficial uh, on the business side or on the ecological side or the health part and uh, that is societal. It's yeah, 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 yeah beneficial for the farmers themselves. Exactly. It's the farmers who are going to be reducing the antibiotics. Yes. Uh, you know. Yeah, I think there's, there's multiple benefits for the farmers. There is one which is often overlooked and that's the farmers' health, the, the health of the farmers themselves. Uh, it, it is demonstrated in many studies that farmers have higher levels of resistance compared to the general public uh, due to the fact that they have intensive contact with, with animals that are often treated with antibiotics. So, so uh, when I talk to farmers, it's always my number one statement, why should you do it? The first reason is to do it is for your own health, because if there's lesser resistance in the animals, there's also lesser risk of transfer of resistance to, to the farmers themselves which it often happens that farmers end up in hospitals with, with injuries, whatever, of surgery, and, and have multiple resistant bacteria. Are uh, they aware of that? Well, they are not very much aware of it. it, it for, for, for some of some are, but, but it's often something overlooked. When farmers think about this topic, they think about the economics, they think about the, the market, where, where they're going to be able to sell their products, but their own health, is that's why I wanted to start with it because it's it's something of and another from from them the veterinary side or the animal production side it is you bring the your animal production to the next level <coughs> often antibiotics are used to cover up bad management if you remove your blanket or you remove your cover you are forced to improve your management 
and improving their management gives you a long-term beneficial effect. So you, you really, by removing a certain type of yeah, cover, a certain type of insurance, you, you are sure that, that, that you, you, some are not capable of doing so. That's also something we have to add to it. it, it, it not, yes. not every farmer has, you need to have a certain level of skills and, and, and attitude. And, it costs skills, it costs energy, it costs work. I'm trying to conclude that. And it is beneficial when it is successful, right? the, taking away the cover. And then um, another question, Jeroen, if we really see that in a um, human medicine uh, environment, the statistics of farmers getting ill and their uh, difficulties of being treated. I'm looking to my colleague, uh, Mark uh, from Ilvo. He told me one time, if a farmer gets in a hospital, he is treated in a more prudent way because the, uh, the, the chance that he is uh, where having uh, resistance is higher. How could that help convincing our farmers? to be more prudent with antibiotics. Do you want to answer, Mark? Well, you're probably talking now about the MRSA, problem. in fact, the hospital uh, bacteria, which is called uh, medicine resistant Staphylococcus aureus, and also really it has MRSA for MRSA. Um, now, it's especially a practice in the Netherlands, uh, where there's uh, some kind of uh, guarantee for farmers which are in fact carriers of uh, this MRSA bacteria because yeah it can lead to life-threatening uh, conditions but it can also spread to the other patients in the hospital so and it can spread also to their own family and so when a farmer is a or, or his one of his uh, family members and they can also be the family members of a farmer which can be in fact infected with this MRSA they have to be in fact, convinced that this can be a risk for themselves, but also for other patients, or in fact, the general population in general. In fact. So that's, an, I think, a very strong uh, objective uh, that this awareness has to be increased. Okay. Is Gemma here? Gemma, you are from the Netherlands. Where is she? Yes. Uh, yes. She has yes. left. Yes. Oh, ready. Mm -hmm. um, maybe Erwin, you can. Um, is there something to take in the? coaching teams in the farmers teams to discuss or is this left out uh, well, to be honest that specific aspect um, I don't know if that's if that's really something you should start a coaching trajectory it with. sounds like a stick it sounds like what well, mm, yeah it's, uh, but it probably also depends on, on Frederick also explains the, the <laughs> importance of being farm specific, person specific in, in your coaching trajectory and that uh, farmers that are not aware of anything that as Jeroen says are totally convinced that they're using uh, well, uh, as little as possible um, to them we should not immediately come up with solutions the knowledge part, what do we think we know we should do this and this and this in those cases, the potential benefits, including potential benefits uh, for their own health or the health of their families, might be something that a coach could bring on the table. Uh, that being said, I, I would be a bit careful because it also sounds a bit threatening scary. Uh, and yeah. scary. Um, okay, Frederick. You want to add something? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, well, we yesterday in our training session on the coaching approach, we had practical advice from people who developed the the method, the other method for, for life chemistry, to, and that's our, 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 our skill as coaches that we need to pick up to feel in the conversation with farmer to which aspects is this person responsive to? Because you have persons who really are convinced of the of the threat for, for, for themselves or for, for the, the global community or the human medicine part, but others are more responsive to the economic benefits or, or just being a good farmer and being improving, improving and, and be better than the rest. So our task is not to do um, one fit for all approach, but get the feeling of what 
type of person we have in front of us and adapt to that and say the right things can either be those yeah, one of those things to get them convinced and it doesn't matter because we have, we just want to reduce and yeah we have the saying the means only the whatever so yeah this is a bit the way of working one thing that struck me in what Jeroen told was you know if you talk to the vets and if you talk to the feed industry they all will plead that their behavior is just at the right level which is not i heard in your words are there any vets in the room or is there feed industry present yes do you want to say something about it how about vets looking at this yes uh, trial to reduce are vets people that stick by the use of antibiotics in your opinion uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity to say something. Uh, my name is uh, Jan Vaart and I'm the director of the European Federation of uh, Veterinarians. I very much want to thank all the speakers for their interesting presentations. I think this arm is also an interesting project because it gives tools to, well, to put all the, uh, the, the, the knowledge we have into practice and I think that's really what counts. I very much agree with what Jeroen said that um, we, are the, we are not there yet, there's still a lot to do. And I also think that um, from uh, our perspective, um, many steps forward have been made, but still there is still a lot to do. And I think it's important that all uh, people who are involved in antimicrobial resistance, uh, like veterinarians, do their homework. <laughs> and that's what we are trying to do. And I see that there are countries that are well advancing and that there are countries that stay a bit behind. And we have to see that everyone gets forward and everyone makes the next step. So um, I, I, I don't want to see this as a criticism, but I think it's a point of encouragement that we have to say, well, we are going in the right direction. Maybe we have to speed up, but we, uh, we, we, go, we go forward. There was another vet or feed industry? Who yes, in the feed industry. I'm, okay. I'm a bookstore representative of FIC, so the European Federation of Do you of feel people. blamed by this arm or by the panel? Oh, no, not, not, not at all, not okay. at all. On the contrary, I think that's there are a number of very interesting uh, uh, approaches uh, when it comes to the objective of reducing the need for antibiotics, and one of it is uh, via nutrition. And uh, I'm very glad that. Uh, feed as an important part in this project and that's very important for us that's been already a, a number of years that we were claiming that feed is not just part of the problem as many people want it to be it's also part of the solution and i mean uh, if uh, the feed industry has been placing on the market medicated feeds uh, in the past it was also a service uh, for the farmers at certain point so now we have an evolution of the legislation, which is pretty good, and we welcome it. Uh, in, I mean, in terms of uh, uh, medicated feed, what we would like to see is an evolution of uh, the legislation also on other aspects. So feed additive, for example, to have a, a, a large opening to this new nutritional solution. You mean alternatives? Alternatives for antibiotics? Or what do you mean exactly? Well, what, I, what I mean that we have a number of potential solutions uh, and you have named a few of them uh, during the presentations and there are many more that have an interaction with the gut, gut health and that's uh, the, the problem that we face at a certain point is a recognition of this solution legally speaking and a recognition of the ability to communicate on the functions of this uh, this uh, solution and that's the bottleneck that we can see uh, nowadays who influences who? Is it the feed industry, the feed uh, enterprises that influence the farmer? Or is it the farmer that puts you into, please give us medicine feed products? I, I don't think that the, the, the equation is, uh, is that one nowadays. Uh, we have a team of people <laughs> advising farmers around the uh, and feed manufacturers are one of them, like the best, not like other people that are working for the Chamber of Agriculture, these kind of things. So it's a concept behind. 
Okay. Um, there is another uh, uh, man, I think. Uh, yes, I'm a man. You were hidden. You were hidden behind others. <laughs> Please tell me who, who you are and what you want to say. My, my name is Terry Loma. I'm from Utrecht University and GD Annual Health, and I'm here as a member of IDF Work Group, one of the world will use. Um, uh, with regard to your question on who influences who, we know from many countries that with respect to animal health, the veterinarian is an important person for farmers. And uh, there are a lot of points that they don't trust the veterinarian on, but for animal health they do. And in the past they had a big influence on the increase of antimicrobial use on dairy farms. And now these days, the country that I come from, the uh, uh, Netherlands, uh, veterinarians also had a, an important role in decreasing it again. And if they wouldn't, then that would have had an effect on the use of antimicrobials by farmers. For instance, in the dairy industry where I work in, we decreased about 50-60% of antimicrobial use. Um, um, with an important part of that, and I believe that has been discussed yesterday, selective dry cow treatment. And oh, this we call selective dry cow treatment, okay. so not treating all cows or drying off in any yes. other. And it has been a success because all stakeholders agreed that this had to be done. Um, but in the end, the farmer asks his veterinarian, what do you think of it? And I think that's, that, should, that role should not be underestimated, although they don't, that, that role is big. And, and as I said, they influence the increase in the use, but it's also important to to um, use them in decreasing the damage. Do I hear you say, you know, we veterinarians do not need an extra coach on the table? No, that's not what I'm saying. Okay. I'm saying in programs like this arm, which is a, a good initiative, um, but other programs do not forget the important people at the table. Okay. And I don't mean literally on the table, but, but in the in the program. They play an important role, so inform them too. You yeah, mean, I think you it's a good idea to have different it. people on the table. Mm -hmm. Food is important. Milking machines are important. Um, uh, ventilation systems are important. So putting it all together, that's important. Yes. Uh, you've got, Friedrich, can you switch up your... Uh, yeah, sorry. Friedrich, you've got um, some suggestions. Here. Yes, thanks very much. Um, we appreciate this uh, contribution and we're very much aware of the important role and the expertise that is in those people present on those farms. Our guidelines to our coaches in the farm is then also to not become the additional expert on the team, but try to stick in the coaching role, try to stick in, in, in the role of guiding those people in facilitate them in, 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 in good collaboration and, and making bring out the potential of all those people in a team to improve the farm. That's our mission and the expertise and the technical knowledge has to come from the technical experts who are familiar with farm as well. And moreover, we also really push the farmer to take ownership of his own team. He is it's his farm, it's his team. He can decide who is present or not. So if uh, somebody else uh, next to a feed advisor and his familiar veterinarian has to be there, like a ventilation specialist, then that's an action point to include somebody also in the team and it's, okay. it's really up to them to yes. take ownership. Edwin, you want to add something? Uh, well, actually I didn't want to add, so I wanted to come back to something that was said previously. Go on. I, can. Um, I wanted to come back to what uh, uh, Jos from the consumer's uh, point of view said about the this project is very much uh, using carrots and, and try to, I think you said, if they uh, seduce farmers, uh, would go <laughs> as far as uh, seducing. Convince. Convincing. Um, but about the stick, I mean, I, I, I hear in what you said that the absence of enough sticks might actually jeopardize our projects to have, to have results if we are only using the carrot. And then my question to you, or maybe others in the audience, would be, what, what are examples of a stick? And should that be the government that is using the stick? Or should that be more the industry? Retailers, consumers? And should the stick be put on farmers? Or those other people that are important? For instance, the veterinarians. Good questions, yours. I mean, there need, these things can work where there is a clean framework. We think that's 
and that's the government, that's the policy makers that have to make the right regulation, and in that framework, these processes can work very well. We got the example from our Irish friend. He copied the Belgian system, and he said we are already further than Belgium because there is regulation. We have to be there. And the regulation needs to affect the farmers, our vets, our the industry, our ventilation uh, providers. Well, we think, for example, uh, antibiotics that are critical for human use. We think we should they should be out of livestock production of meat production, like we have already in the Scandinavian countries, so it should be forbidden to use them. David, do you agree? There are, I would have to say that the vast or majority of the antibiotics that are used in livestock, I think the figure was 66.5% from the last class ESFAG report, are actually very old antibiotics. It's the tetracyclines, the penicillins, the sulfonamides. If you look towards the ones that we would think of as important, some were never registered in veterinary, so the fifth generation kephrosporins, things like that. But then for the third and fourth generation kephrosporins, the fluoroquinolones, the amount that we actually use in livestock farming is very small. It's sort of 0.2% of all the antibiotics used. So I think, and it is important, I will agree, that they they need to be held for human use in that they have to remain available for human use. But I think there is also a need, from a veterinary point of view, there are certain diseases in animals where those are the best treatments. And I think you also need them for that, for animal health and welfare. So I think it's striking that balance between, you know, you need, we're all human, we all want to be able to be treated in the future. But on the other hand, we also want to be able to treat our sick animals. Give me my freedom. Is that the conclusion? No, I don't think it's give us our freedom. There are restrictions in place. You know, lots of countries, if you want to use some of these critically important antibiotics, you have to do an antibiogram first to show that that is the only antibiotic that will work. Yeah. So there is that. For others, such as colistin, we are going down the route of restrictions and try to phase out. So I think there are things we're doing. There are restrictions in place. Professor De Will, are you agreeing with Mr. John? <clears throat> well, partially. Um, I was reacting on the on the numbers discussion. Um, I think these percentages and claiming that only a few percentages are of, of antibiotics used in veterinary medicine are critically important is is a bit, I mean, it's right. If you look at kilograms of active substance, it's right, but it doesn't really tell you anything uh, besides the fact that those critical important antibiotics have a very low molecular weight and therefore uh, they do not add up to high volumes in kilograms. What's your point? Well, the point is that they were used a lot and they still are used a lot. And the, me the metric to be used is the number of treatment days. It's much better. And if you use that metric, they they will pop up in a, in a more important. But this, I was very much agreeing on the second point, And that's also the case that we made in Belgium and in other countries, even before us. If you if you make regulations of them then in saying, well, you can use them only if you can prove that there is no alternative then they're still available for use. And we've done that in Belgium. Within two years, we've reduced the amount of critical CIAs with over 80% without, and that's the important part, without any negative side effect for animal health. Again, showing you, and beforehand, everybody was claiming as well, we using it only when we need it. It's responsible use, and if you're gonna remove that, uh, you're going to see a lot of, of health issues. Nonetheless, the, the legislation uh, with support or with motivation from, from, from the, the consumers, uh, the legislation was changed and we didn't see this effect. And that's where we have to challenge the status quo. From time to time, we have to go a little bit further. I think we go a little bit aside from the discussion with this arm because we are now talking about 
do we need more regulation? It is very interesting for me. But it is a little bit aside. Mr. Veterinary, what do you want to comment on? You were waving at me. I would like to come back on the point about uh, the stick. Um, yes. I think it's important when you want to use a stick that you hit the right people. Exactly. And that you do not hit. Who do you want to hit? Nobody. <laughs> I think that I want to hit the people that use more or use. So, use the heavy much. users? Do you want to hit the heavy users? Because what, you, there what, are. You, what I want to say is that you need to be transparent on what is used where, and then you can make a kind of benchmarking system, what is used in some countries, and you can categorize farms or practices or farms, whatever, in let's say green, yellow, and red categories. Okay. Okay. So you can make a system where you say the red ones, they will not get away with it. Okay. Thank you. There is another person. Are you a veterinary as well? Yeah, working for a farms organization. Henrik uh, from Denmark. Uh, yeah, I'm just uh, thinking about, uh, we're talking about this, uh, there might be a need in a certain farm, there might be a need for use of an antibiotic, maybe a critical antibiotic. But this certain farm has a certain level of house, has a, a certain uh, housing system, maybe not the best. They have a certain uh, level of uh, management, maybe not the best. Will it still be okay to use uh, these critical antibiotics in this situation, or could we uh, come up with some demands? that if you should use a critical antibiotics, then it's, you, have, you need to have a minimum level of uh, housing, ventilation, management, or something like that. Yes. Okay, this is one question, but I have another question for you. You are from Denmark. Um, your figures are quite well, on average, aren't they? I mean, if I look at the averages of use in uh, other countries in Europe, how do you look at the system of this arm to further reduce the use of antibiotics. Do you believe in it? Do you? Uh, is it? Will it be uh, more difficult for Danish farmers still to go further away from use? How do you look at this arm? Yeah, of course. If you believe in that, and uh, especially if you use the, the coaching, uh, we've been talking a lot about that yesterday. What's your hope? Hmm. I, yeah. I, I'm, no, I don't know what but my hope is. Uh, I think you can. Uh, I think you can reduce, still reduce it. Might might be possible to use even with a uh, fifty percent or something like that. Maybe even more. We can. Uh, we have been looking into the use of antibiotics in the organic production. Is the low hanging fruit already? Yeah. Picked? No, there will still be some. Okay. In general, there will be uh, some of them are already picked, but there will still be some in the, in the, in most farms. Okay. Yeah. First the room, and then you. Who are you? My name is Henning Imbrex. I'm working here in Brussels, South, which is the Belgium Institute for Health. Um, of human health or animal health? Both. Oh. Both. Both. The one, oh, sorry, the, the, the one uh, there is um, an animal health and, um, and public health, so it's a uh, one health approach in, uh, here. Uh, my question, but it, it's uh, along the same line. I, I like the idea to, to, to say, okay, we, we have to reduce, we have to reduce, reduce, but there has to be a certain limit, I think. I mean, are there any, of course, are, what are the benchmarks? What is the, is this animal? Um, animal welfare, for instance, coming into play at, at this uh, at this time, and how do you? I, I mean, I'm not sure that I uh, catch this. What do you Is mean? That, the, we well, mean well, reduce. We can we can show, or you can show after two years or three years that, that there is a re reduction. Okay, but um, but Jeroen says okay, there is not. Um, uh, I have to go. We we have to to head for the the reduction even more and more. But there must be some limit, or not, because we, we just heard that uh, animals get sick and then they have to be treated. Also, is that where animal? That's my question. Is that where the animal um, uh, welfare is coming to play? And the second point is, what are your your um, your benchmarks? What, where are you heading for? When uh, after two or three years, you will say, okay, that this harm project is really um, it, it was it was a success. Very interesting question. Thank you. Can you switch out your microphone? Erwin Rogers has uh, the word. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to, I'm also keeping one eye on the um, people who are 
take any questions or comments online. Are just yeah, just one comment uh, reinforcing what's just been said about uh, restrictions on the use of certain types of third and fourth generation antimicrobials. Uh, unless, uh, like Lud said, uh, there is no alternative available, and that in this example came from Sweden, and that also in Sweden this really helped reducing that use. Um, comment so far uh, says nothing about what it did then to health and, and welfare, which then relates to your comment. Uh, but then I, I think, and I, I'm, we are getting this carrot stick thing, and I, I do tend to understand from the room that sticks are necessary, but then the carrot we are demonstrating might help um, might help to comply with restrictions and, and with uh, more severe restrictions on the use of antibiotics and antimicrobials of in a way that does not hamper health and welfare and even economics. You are the second one. First, we get a question from the streaming uh, attendants. No, ah, you, you have already treated that. Who are you and what do you want to say? Hello, my name is Axel Hansen. I'm working for the Federation of Swedish Farmers here in Brussels, so I just want to comment that this program, I think it's really good. Uh, Why? Uh, because you need to, uh, you need to, for the farmers, you, you need to see the benefits, uh, also economic, not only health. Uh, but of course, in Sweden, we have a, had a lot of sticks. So uh, uh, that's why it has been easy to reduce uh, antibiotics. But uh, I think we should uh, work both with sticks and carrots. And, uh, and you, you, you need to see the benefits for the farmers. That's, that's a key. Okay? okay? Thank you. This was a statement, not a question. Statement. Thank you very much. Very good work. Yes. Switch out. The other person, yes, you were waving at me, yeah. you had to draw. Well, I'd like to make a comment on, on as much as needed. I agree with you that uh, we should try to decrease antibiotic use in all sectors, but there's also an argument to use as much as needed, and that's not only animal health and animal welfare, that's also antimicrobial resistance. We've seen that on, in some situations, the, the, the decreasing itself is a goal which leads to underdosing of antibiotic treatments, which may have a negative effect on antimicrobial resistance development. So that underlines my, my earlier statement that the veterinarian or somebody who knows about antibiotics should be involved in this kind of thing. We've seen people using half antibiotic tubes for mastitis and that kind of uh, that kind of things. And then then it goes to goes to far. So if you treat, do it as much as needed. Yes. Treat well. That's what you were saying. If you treat, treat well. Do it That's as it. it needs to be done. Right. Thank you very much for your statement. There is a man there who wants to say something, and uh, you as well. Okay. First, sir. Hello, my name is Miguel Acarriera from the Hispanic Speed Farmer. My question is about the consumers and now to the labeling of the products what do you think i this have this question for the for the people on the table what's your opinion about the labeling of the products free of antibiotics can be a carrot or is a stick for the farmers and what can you explain a bit more about the yeah, situation now, in spain now more of the maybe the retailers want to have a differentiated product and maybe we are working more in animal welfare, but more times uh, working in free antibiotics products. And, um, and we will see that there are not any benefits for the farmer because there are not differentiation in the prices for, for this kind of products. It's only um, mandatory rules for the for the writers, for the retainer that if you would like to provide them, you have to produce in that way. Do you so, think that it is more expensive to produce with less or without and depending on the system because there are a tricky option because like when you are trying to produce free of antibiotics you have to have plan b and plan a plan a is free of antibiotics but what's happened if you heard that your animal are sick you have to break and you don't allow 
to market these products in the a product without free. So you need to have an, another alternative. Uh, and this is tricky because at the end, uh, you are trying to make a production here of antibiotics, but then you have another options. Uh, if you have to do that, at the end, there are not any benefit for the farmers because uh, you are trying to make as better as you can, so produce without antibiotics. But at the end, if you have any problem, you have an alternative market. What happens if we have not any alternative market? What happens if there are not any option with these animals that are treated with antibiotics? So because now they debate this, this at this point, the retailers. The retailers, they want to choose to have, okay, I would like to live in my products in my in my supermarkets without any production or any antibiotics in the okay. production. I What's happening with that? What's happening with that? So what happened with the labeling? So it's something that promotes and is very positive for the farmers because it's an incentive or we are under the pressure of the retailers and we have not any option. Okay, I hear you use the word zero use. This is something else than what we talked about until now. I'm looking at yours, Tom Brugge. The retailers, so consumers, maybe that's the same kind of pressure. No, 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 it's the same. Sorry, I apologize for that. This is not saying the same, the consumer and the retailer. This is a very big, big mistake. Okay. Retailers and consumers are not the same. Retailers manage the consumers, but not the same. Yours, can you? Try to answer. You are now asked about retailers who put the pressure on the farmer without any extra benefit. Is it possible to elevate animals without antibiotics? Completely. Never use them. Yes. It's possible. In some cases, also. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And it is, it is increasingly more have been done uh, it is uh, yeah. so you, you see this uh, you see this popping up in different countries different parts of the world and, and it's just growing 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 heading back is it more expensive um, not necessarily it should not be is it uh, is it better but, but for it, it, well it, it shouldn't be if, if you if you raise your animals healthy and they don't get sick you don't need antibiotics that's that's the idea but but the, the comment made is, is very valid from from Miguel in the sense that there is always a, a, a there is a part of the population that should be that that has to be treated as uh, like if we are all healthy in the room, nobody of us is taking antibiotics, but whenever we get sick, we want to have an antibiotic to be treated. Or else we die. Well, yeah, but the, the whole thing is that, and I, I'm persuaded, and that's also a, bit, a, a little bit relating to the question of pain, how low can you go, or well, what, what is the bottom I think the bottom line is never, ever any preventive use. No group treatments, no preventive use, that's all the part that, that is replaceable, not immediately, but, but with the rethink, you can rethink systems so that you get rid of it. The, the curative treatment of individual cases that are sick will, will likely be there. And then you need to be able, if you, if you talk, start thinking about production systems where you have never ever used, that those that are treated once or twice with an antibiotic, that you can still yeah, they're not lost for the market, but they, they, they do not get without any value because that would be that would be a shame. That would be a very negative side effect of an unwanted side effect. Is that an answer to your question? Yes. This is, this if we start is, this with is the prevention of my question. Okay. Thank How you. is possible, but at the end you need another attempt. Yes. There is a question from the streaming uh, attendants. Uh, it's again not a it's again not a question, but a uh, reinforcement and a confirmation of what you just said. It sounds as if you're in secret contact with <laughs> some of these persons on the live stream. But it's uh, it's about a situation in Sweden where indeed. Who is it? Do we know who it is? No, no. It's an anonymous reaction. Um, sure. uh, yeah, Johanna. <laughs> Johanna. So Johanna, if you're listening. <laughs> um, also in Sweden, it's uh, that, that's, that up to 90 percent of the use is really is, is in individual animals. It's not group or herd flock treatments, uh, just in case. And then that's uh, well, according to the comment, it has to do with, with Swedish policy that says that the just in case use of both groups, uh, the, the so-called prophylactic use, 
it's not acceptable. It should not cover up um, bad management, bad hygiene okay. situation. You wanted to say something. Just first a comment on your uh, reaction that when we not treat when we are ill, we are not treating with antibiotics that we will die. I think it's better to say we will suffer more. Suffer more because we will not always die. And okay. that's already the difference. Some humans are sick and don't go to the doctor. And others go to the doctor and get their medicines. You understand? But most are happy later on. I apologize for uh, my reaction. That brings me to the question about one health. Because it's a matter of one health, it has been observed. And we are discussing now the situation in the animal health sector, in the animal sector. And of course, a lot of projects are running. And we know that uh, progress has been made. Uh, we know there are systems in place uh, where we can follow each of the partners in the chain, what they are doing in this area. So we know in some situations, in some countries, which veterinarians are prescribing how much and when and where. So we have already, in some situations, the tools in hand to identify critical points, etc. Uh, so, but of course, so. but of course, it's a matter of yeah, we have front runners and we have followers and we have people who are staying far okay. behind. And of course, the question is how we may encourage everybody to follow and to do the best what we may expect. And that brings me to the one health issue. We are, let's say, more or less aware of what we are doing in our sector. But are we aware about what's happening in the, in, the, in the human health sector, the public health sector? May we encourage each other? And how we may encourage each other? And that's also a question for the representative no, of the consumer not, organization. I think it's not a question for this panel. Let's clear our own house, which is now Animal use of okay, and maybe I'm complicated. I want to say something. I, you want to say? Oh, I'm sorry. You also want to, to give you an answer. I'm sorry. I He's completely to... right. There are enormous problems there. And in Belgium, it's also monitored. The doctor's prescription behavior is monitored. But what's done with it is not going far enough for us. The, the bad ones that prescribe a lot are not really punished. My question was also about good examples for both sectors that may encourage each other in both sectors. Okay. You understand to make progress. I understand. Okay. Can, can I just can I just yes, very yes. very brief comment? I think if by what happened in the past a lot in my country and I know in other countries as well is that the one group is blaming the other, the human medicine group. No, no, but we can help in the sense that if we take care of what is happening in veterinary medicine. We can neutralize this discussion now for, and we can put also the human medicine for their own responsibility because they have no longer the option to put the, the responsibility somewhere somewhere else. So, and so in that sense, by doing our job, by cleaning our own house, we are helping actually also mm -hmm. to the whole to to, to to then clean their house. Okay, we are entering the last five minutes. I have some general questions for you. What do you expect us to do and to realize with this arm? And um, then I want uh, the conclusion of Erwin. But you have the four last question. Uh, it's not so much a question, it's a, it's a comment. I think indeed uh, in the animal health sector or in the animal sector, we have to do our homework. and. It, What's going on in the in the medical world is not an excuse for us not to do our homework. But what I want to mention is that, for example, uh, tomorrow we have a meeting of the the medical profession, the dentist, the pharmacist, and the veterinarians with the student organizations, the medical students, the veterinary students, and to speak about one health education to have a better understanding what each of the partners is doing and how we can encourage and strengthen each other's uh, efforts. The word education is interesting. Are vets well educated in this topic? The, I think, uh, well, there's a lot of education on uh, responsible use of antimicrobials. I think more can be done on disease prevention. I think we have always looked a lot at which antimicrobial, how much, uh, how long, etc. But there's a lot to gain in 
better housing, better feeding, etc. What is discussed today? That's one thing. The other thing is that when I was a student, it was not so much an issue. So it depends also on what generation you belong. I think the younger uh, vets they have got more education and more training and has to come into the profession. Maybe There's also a lot of postgraduate education. Coaches can make them aware of the new situation, new insights, another kind of role, more prevention, more advising not to use instead of treating. The, uh, the, the, the role of the veterinarian is certainly uh, uh, changing. And I think there's more about um, indeed keeping healthy animals healthy rather than treating sick animals. Which is another kind of business model. It's another kind of, uh, of business model, yes. For the vet. Uh, for the vet, yes, and for, for a lot of people involved, I think. But I think in general, it's not only between the vet and the, and the farmer or people in this coaching group. I think it, it's a larger societal discussion how do we want to keep animals? Do we want to go for large volumes for low prices? Or do we say we want to have quality products and if necessary, we are prepared to pay a bit more for that? And that's also some of the things that play an important role. We look at it now from the technical side, but there's much more to, to say there. Joost, do you feel something uh, of a role for you as a consumer organization to this price, a better price for Another quality? Of course, we have an education and role to learn people that for a low price it's not possible to have always high quality. But you cannot expect if these offers are in the supermarket that consumers in mass will turn their back on them. That will not happen. The citizen is not that will the not same happen. as the consumer. You have to make that the production rules are clear for everyone and that in that frame they work, they produce, and there will be a price on it. And if that's the price that's in the supermarket, the consumer will pay it. But if besides you let systems exist that can do it much cheaper, these cheaper products will be bought also. And you can you have you have a, a group of consumers that we choose the better ones, but you have a group of consumers that go for the, the lowest price. 25% of consumers is the price, the most determining factor in their choice. The citizen is not a consumer, and the consumer is not a retailer. That was the point. Exactly. Also, okay. Yes. Point taken. Edgar, how is the situation in Ireland uh, uh, going, uh, looking at prices and going for a higher price when having to, to, mm. to get more energy in the farm in their life cycle system? Ireland is not a very, a very well developed uh, market in terms of specialty products and things like that, so it's not really good for a, for a very basic range. Like for, I work mainly with pigs and poultry, so you have the, the pigs and the pigs you don't even have. Uh, Are farmers um, <coughs> fearing the situation that they need to further reduce and that they, they will um, have another kind of business plan then? I think, uh, and, and this is the, part, the relevant part for, for, um, for the project. I'm lucky that I'm, I'm from Spain, so it's a very different, very different approach. And then when, when uh, Miguel Ángel was talking about antibiotic-free products in Europe. It's not something that has been for a long time, but I live in the U.S. for four years, and there is something normal that you see in the shelves. So when you compare the situation, I think for the project it's very important to consider where you are doing the advice. Because, for example, we have now the, the EIP group for poultry, and, and there was a fight. I'm the coordinator, so there was a fight recently that I have to intervene. A fight? Yeah, because the people from the north, they were saying that they were blaming the ones in the south because they were using more antibiotics and there was a cultural issue. And I say, you have to hold it there. And I'm the coordinator, but I have to intervene here. Cultural issue? Yeah, it, it, it is it is in the background. And, and it's, it is a, a different way of farming, a different way of, of approaching the market. It's, it's, it, and it is very important. For example, I'll give you an example. When I went from Spain to Ireland, and that's an interesting thing in terms of disease in itself, in Spain, uh, all the pigs when they are win, they have diarrhea. So I went to Ireland and say, okay, we have 
and they wanted to represent the antibiotics, and I said, okay, let's let's start with the diarrhea. And they look at me and say, diarrhea? Diarrhea, why diarrhea? We have respiratory issues, I said. Wait, wait, wait a moment, you don't have Why do the piglets in Ireland not have diarrhea? It's not that they don't have it, but it's, it's much easier to control. Why? Because Ireland never, ever, ever goes beyond 20 degrees. It's as simple as that. So the pipes in Spain, you will have 39 degrees in the pipes all the time. So the bacteria grow like this. If you have a pipe that is outside in Ireland, it's stable between 5 and 15 all year round. Temperature of the water. Yeah, even that stupid thing is super, super, super important. So when, when you blame less, when you do this differentiation, it's not about blaming, but also adapting. And that's the, again, that's the important part for me for the project. You have to adapt that other than the language, obviously. <laughs> to because you you will say like the the pipe that we have all our farms for example go from the south yeah. to the Finnish bit okay so it, it's a very different approach that when Miguel Angel faces that all the winners by the fault of the the guys in Denmark all the winners by the fault travel 400 kilometers wait it's a different situation for me it's very difficult to stop diseases between parts of the farm for them it's very difficult to manage an animal that has been in a track for us. but it is what it is like the system is very different and we call beyond, and it's funny because in the back of our mind we have it. it there is a cultural thing there, but there is also an adaptation in a positive way that needs to happen. Every system in every country for every animal is different. Our cows are hundred percent grass fed. Any other country in the room? No. So it's a very different situation. So that is what um, uh, this arm was already emphasizing: the individual situation of farms. Farms in different sectors, farms in different regions, you need to have a very individual approach. I understood that from your introductions. Okay, I'm looking at the time. This was a very interesting discussion, I think. Probably you wanted to say more. I thank you very much for your attention. I thank very much the panelists, Jeroen, Edgar, David, Joost. I give the floor to Erwin to say the final words. And then this is the end of the day. Uh, okay, thank you, Craig. Um, I'm not going to draw quick and long conclusions, uh, but uh, let me just say I thank you all for being here, showing interest in the project, and to giving us input. Uh, I noticed quite a lot of this down and really some interesting discussions that are important for us, uh, looking about the, the context specificity, uh, not assuming that everything uh, is the same everywhere, uh, butter sticks, even though our project is really much, very much feeding carrots, still think about the stick. Um, but uh, let me just say that we are going to make a kind of report about this, with also some images and some, uh, how do you call that, uh, I forgot the words, but we will summarize this, we will summarize the discussions that have been held here, the, um, the topics that were discussed, and that will be distributed. Uh, we will directly contact you, but it will also be um, available on our, mainly on our online uh, uh, things we have, websites and uh, Twitter accounts, etc. Um, so now all that's, that I still want to do is uh, also from my part, or uh, on behalf of DISARM, I thank uh, Jeroen, David, Joost, and uh, Edgar for being our additional panelists. Uh, I have to look at my uh, name list of people who have to thank. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Gemma, uh, who is not here anymore, uh, Tommy, and Bart Vergoten, the farmer you saw on the video, uh, to, for being willing uh, to provide a testimony on how the coaching approach uh, multi actor farmhouse plan has been working out for them. And then, uh, last but not least, um, we are, Felix and I are part of the coordination team of this arm, and I get the honor to do a short intro and then the outro, but actually the, I want to thank the like real organizers of uh, this event, and that's in the first place, uh, the people from Kovac Vegeta, our host of the day, so Nenat, who was there, but who is maybe outside preparing the network drink, uh, Nenat Paula and others at Copa uh, also the people from ZLTO uh, who are uh, taking care of all the IT or ICT issues and uh, did a lot of work in the organization. Uh, and Laura from Innovation for Agriculture, uh, who are actually the real organizers of uh, this event. So, with this, I uh,
thank you again for coming and we invite you all to continue maybe the discussions about antibiotics or to discuss about uh, some more neutral topics uh, with a drink uh, just outside uh, the room here. Thank you.